G'day everyone, welcome to this episode of Reboot Your Thinking Podcast. This is episode eight and the title is How to Be Happier Tomorrow, right? So uh, it's basically nine simple things that you may not have thought of that you can do today in order to be happier tomorrow. Um, I get a lot of questions about happiness and, and how to be happy and what does happy mean and how do I find it and um, who is responsible for it and how important it is in our lives. And um, it's really the, the time when you realize happiness is important in your life is when you're not having it, you know, when it's not as readily as accept, uh, uh, accessible as it is in other times in your life. And so, um, yeah, I want to make it really simple today. So we're just going to talk about nine very simple things um, that you can do today in order to be happier tomorrow. Um, I know this seems like a impossible task sometimes, so let's make it really, really simple. Okay, so there's nine things, and we're going to go through each one. And I, I've got heaps of sort of peer-reviewed and evidence-based research to chuck in along the way. Um, so it's not just me, you know, spouting my opinions, but it's it's, it's this is all backed by science, um, as usual on this podcast. So number one. The first thing, very simple thing you can do today in order to be happier tomorrow, number one is spend some time in nature. Um, Research has shown that spending time in nature can improve your mood, it can reduce stress, it can improve cognition, um, and, and it can improve happiness. So even just a few minutes outside in a green space can make a difference. So the green thing is actually really important. Some of the work that I do is with people who live with dementia. And uh, there's a lot of research now that says greens and blues, in particular greens, um, and I don't mean broccoli, like the, the color green is actually a really positive thing for cognition, for the slowing down of cogn- uh, degenerative things going on in the brain that, imp- that decrease cognition, like dementia, um, but also with mental illness as well. So there's a growing body of research that suggests that spending time in nature has significant benefits for mental health and well-being in general. Um, being in nature can reduce your stress, it can improve mood, uh, it can improve self-esteem, it increases self-esteem um, for some reason, it promotes positive emotions like joy and or even, you know, to be able to just sit back and go, wow, this is beautiful. What I'm looking at right now is not a screen, is not the inside of my house, it's not the inside of my eyelids, it's, it's you know, it's really awesome in the word, in the true sense of the word, right? One of, one of the theories behind why nature is so beneficial for mental health is this concept called biophilia which um, suggests that humans have an innate tendency to seek connections with nature and other forms of life. Um, so when we're in nature, we, we may feel a sense of relaxation and restoration that can help to reduce um, feelings of stress and anxiety. Um, this, is, this is science, right? This is not just me. So in terms of the am- amount of time that you need to experience the benefits of nature, research suggests that even just a few minutes outside in a green space can make a relatively big difference. Um, so for example, uh, there was a study um, in 2010 that found that participants who took a 50-minute walk, 5-0 walk in a natural Um, setting reported improving their mood and lowering their levels of anxiety compared to those who took a walk in an urban setting for much less time. So, you know, um, it it, it shows that just getting outside, but also getting outside in some way that's different from your everyday um, environment really, really helps. There's there's one study which I'm going to look into a bit here. Um, It's from 2021, so it's very recent in a journal called um, Ecological Applications. The title of the, the study is A Room with a Green View, um, the importance of nearby nature for mental health. So, I, I, and again, I'll put all of these um, links in the show notes. So if you want to look further into any of these papers, um, you can do that. But basically the paper investigated the impact of nearby nature 
on mental health. Um, and the authors argue that access to green spaces like parks and gardens has become even more important for mental health, um, you know, post pandemic and during the pandemic as, as people were kind of spending more time indoors then and experiencing increased stress and anxiety as a result. I mean, we can all probably relate to that, um, coming out of the, um, coronavirus stuff. So, um, the paper reviewed sort of previous research on the benefits of nature for mental health, um, including the improved mood, reduced stress, and the increased cognitive functioning that I that I referenced before. Um, and the authors found that, so they did a, a it was a study of 3,000 adults. So it was a Japanese study. Um, in Japan, 3,000 adults, which found that people had, who had access to green spaces within one kilometer of their home, reported mental better mental health than those who did not have access to it. So this was even in, interesting that, um, that you didn't even need to be in that green space, but just to have it near you actually improved your mental health. Um, if you knew you could access it in less than a kilometer away from your home, then that was... And, and this isn't... We're not talking about big woods here or big, you know, massive commons or forests or anything like that. Like a, a you know, a, a very small park or playground, which... You know, a lot of us are very fortunate to have close to our home um, can actually improve our mental health. Just knowing it's there is actually a a, a pretty interesting finding. Another surprising finding um, from the from the paper was that even like knowing it was there, as I said, but even just um, having a view of nature from a window. (laughs) So even if you could see nature out of your window, um, the study found that people who had a, a, a view of greenery from their home reported better mental health than those who did not have that view. Even even when controlling for other factors like age and gender and income, like it, none of that mattered. What mattered was that you could look out your window and see some green, that you could look out your window and see something that wasn't bricks and, and mortar of the next door or, or whatever. So that's kind of interesting. And I know, I, you know, I understand that not everyone can look out their window and see nature. And, and some people are very fortunate to be able to do that. But um, I can just tell you from from a scientific point of view, um, you know, it made a difference to to um, to mental health. And one of the points the the authors make in the paper is that policymakers and urban planners should be prioritising access to these green spaces in in really built up urban areas because it just promotes um, a better mental health and well being. Um, in the, commu- in the community. And, and there was another study um, in, also from 2021. This was from the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Um, and it's about activity participation and, and particularly with in, in adults, in, in sort of in adolescents, sorry, in younger, younger adults. So it looked at the impact of outdoor activities on the mental health and well-being of adolescents. Um, as opposed to training and participating in sport and activities inside. And the authors argue that again, the pandemic um, had a significant impact on adolescent mental health and and many adolescent um, people experience increased stress and anxiety and social isolation as as we all did. uh, The study looked into the relationship between outdoor activity participation and mental health um, among adults, this was an American study, um, it found that the adolescents who participated in outdoor activities, things like hiking, um, going for walks, bushwalking, biking, fishing, um, anything that was done out in, again, in nature reported better mental health and well-being than those that didn't or those that, that did things inside like, uh, you know, uh, riding the Peloton bike or, or watching... Um, you know, CrossFit stuff in their, uh, on the internet and doing that themselves in their home during the pandemic, um, they found that that wasn't as good for your for their mental health, for adolescents' mental health. So it found that the benefits of the outdoor activity um, was particularly strong for adolescents who were already, already experiencing, you know, mental health challenges before the pandemic. Um, and these adolescents reported significant improvements in their mental health and well-being after participating in outdoor activities. And which is interesting, right? And one of the surprising things from the paper is that outdoor activity participation had a stronger impact on mental health and well-being than other factors such as screen time and social media use. 
right? The study found that while screen time and social media use were associated with negative mental health outcomes, outdoor activity participation had a stronger impact on mental health and well-being. I mean, that doesn't, that's not incredibly surprising, but given the consumption of these uh, social media and screen time and, and stuff in general for adolescents and younger people, you know, it's an important finding, right? So yeah, overall that paper highlights the importance of getting outside and doing things outside for promoting mental health and well-being um, particularly during t- times of stress and anxiety right so that that was obviously representative in the pandemic but outside of that any other times where there is a, a time of stress and uncertainty adolescents will benefit um, from getting outside and doing things outside um, so you know overall spending time in nature is a simple and accessible largely accessible way to promote mental health and well-being right whether it's taking a walk in the park sitting under a tree or simply looking out a window with a view of nature if you're lucky to have one um, incorporating incorporating some time in nature into your daily routine can have significant benefits for your mental health so that's number one get outside um, commune with nature all right and number two is to practice gratitude but but I, I know I bang on about gratitude a lot so in this context we're going to specifically talk about one particular type of gratitude right so first some background taking time each day to reflect on things that you are grateful for can help shift your mindset and increase feelings of productivity Um, practicing gratitude involves intentionally in folk intentionally focusing on and appreciating the positive aspects of your life right whether it's something big or something small um, and it shifts your focus away from the negative thoughts and emotions and and instead cultivates feelings of joy and contentment and happiness which is important for today right And, and just as a side note when you when you write down things that you're grateful for, you are more grateful for those things. You've heard me say that before. Um, that is absolutely true from a neuropsychology point of view, from a neurobiology point of view. It is absolutely proven that when you write something down that you're grateful for, you become more grateful for that thing. Um, research has also shown that if you regularly practice gratitude, um, it impacts positively on your mental health and your well being. Um, there's one study that I looked at found that individuals who practiced gratitude had greater levels of life satisfaction and positive affect, you know, as well as lower levels of depression and anxiety. But, you know, that's pretty impressive. Another study found that individuals who practiced gratitude had improved sleep quality and duration of sleep was improved. So, you know, there's lots of different, um, ways to boost your your happiness and there's something as simple as just being grateful for when you are happy or grateful for what makes you happy or what makes you feel nice you know and that's a very simple thing that's that's accessible for all of us really um the study in particular the type of gratitude that i want to just focus on is single session gratitude right so just not the regular keeping of a gratitude journal as i I would love you to do because i've just told you how great that is and how easy it is and 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 i just think it's a i just think it's a free hit for us to keep that sort of thing regularly in our life but this paper was from actually from this year it was published earlier this year and it's um from the journal of positive psychology the title is the impact of single session gratitude interventions on stress and affect And uh, the paper explores the effects of single session gratitude interventions on on stress and on uh, general affect and life satisfaction um, and investigated whether a brief gratitude intervention can reduce stress levels and improve your affect, right? So even just very briefly, just being really grateful for something in the moment, right? The study was a small sample size, it's 80 participants, it's not huge. But they completed a single session gratitude intervention that involved writing about things they were grateful for in their lives, right? It's a one-off sort of thing. The participants completed pre- and post-intervention measures of stress and affective states, including measures of positive and negative affect, right? So they they knew they had a baseline, then they um, performed the single session gratitude and then tested them afterwards to test uh, their affect and, and how that changed that, right? The study found 
that the gratitude intervention led to significant reductions in stress levels and improvements in positive affect. Specifically, the participants reported lower levels of perceived stress after the intervention and higher levels of positive affect compared to before the intervention, which is crazy, right? That there's something that as simple as that can, can make such a drastic change. One, one surprising find, a finding from the paper is that the effects of the gratitude intervention were sustained then over time. The study found that the participants' stress levels remained lower and their positive affect remained higher even two weeks after the intervention. Um, So, you know, overall, the single session gratitude has a significant and lasting effect on stress and affective states. And the authors of the paper argue that these interventions could be a simple and effective way to promote mental health and well-being at a much, much larger scale, right? Practicing gratitude doesn't have to be time consuming or complicated. It can be as simple as taking a few minutes each day to write down or think about things you're grateful for, um, such as good health or supporting family or supportive and kind friends, um, a beautiful sunset, a kind gesture from a stranger, right? By, By actively focusing on these positive aspects of your life, people may find the overall outlook on life improves and they'll find in that in turn that they are better able to cope with stress and adversity Um, they sleep better they have better relationships Um, and when you write down what you're grateful for you become even more grateful for it so the the benefit of this is exponentially bigger outward from there so that's number two number three is connect with someone um And if people know me in real life, they know this isn't a funny one because I'm a bit of a recluse and and can be, but um, social connection is very, very important for mental health. It's not just about the quality, uh, sorry, the quantity of relationships, you know, quality matters too. It doesn't matter. I I I know people who have lots and lots and lots of friends and they're very lonely and they're very disconnected um, because the quality of those friendships are Uh, aren't that great you know they've gone for quantity rather than quality so think about reaching out to a friend or a loved one to deepen the connection you already have potentially right human beings are social creatures and and social connections are an important aspect of mental health and well-being Um, studies have shown that people who have strong social relationships tend to be happier Um, they have greater resilience they're more emotionally stable than those who are experiencing social isolation. And we've just been through a massive um, involuntary social isolation. So it's important to get these skills back and get that happiness back in our life now that we can reconnect with people. Um, The quality of social relationships, though, is just as important as the quantity, as I mentioned before. It's, it's not enough to simply have many social connections. It's important to cultivate deep and meaningful relationships with others, right? This means taking the time to really connect with people, to listen and to show empathy and to share experiences and to share emotions, to, to be vulnerable and um, allow someone to see who you really are and, and what you're really feeling, you know? Um, the one of the papers that I looked at, which I think is, is worth talking about here, is from 2021. It's out of the Journal of Adolescent Health. And it's about the perceived socioeconomic, uh, socio-emotional sorry, uh, impact of the pandemic and the implications for mental health from that. So this is an American study. Um, and it uh, included sort of an online survey and, and really in-depth interviews they actually did with a very diverse group of, of younger people. And the findings revealed that adolescents experienced significant stress and anxiety related to social, isola- social isolation and uncertainty about their future. The study also found that social support, resilience, and adaptive coping strategies were important factors that helped mitigate the negative effect on mental health. Right? One, one surprising finding was that some adolescents reported positive changes in their lives due to improved relationships with family members and, and more time for self-reflection and personal growth. 
like that's you know we talk about friendship a lot and social connections being built with people outside of our family but this this paper found that when these adolescent these young people tried to build on and improve the relationships with family members then it had an overall positive effect as well um which is nice right it's not just about families it's not just about friendships and mateship so regardless of how you choose to connect with others the important thing is to prioritize relationships invest time and energy in cultivating that deep meaningful connection right by doing so you might find that your sense of happiness from fulfillment um, and overall well-being really Im- improves right connecting with others takes many forms depending on your preferences and your circumstances so you know it might involve calling a friend or family member to catch up reaching out to someone you haven't spoken to in a while making plans to do something fun or meaningful together right um, it could also involve uh joining a social group or a club that aligns with your interests if you don't if if you're not overflowing with social connections right now this is a good way to do that you know it might be a a walking group or a a crossfit gym or a boxing gym or um, a book club or you know something that aligns with your interests where other people are coming together as well and you're able to investigate your hobby and your interests but also you're able to build your self-esteem build your self-worth build your um health and well-being physically and mentally at the same time which is nice too um so that's number three number four is to move your body in a new way right so a a few podcast episodes ago we talked about the power of movement in general now this one specifically is talking about moving your body in a new way right trying to trying a new form of exercise or movement can not only challenge your body but also engage your mind, which boosts your mood. So so you can do the same things you've always done, right? But th- we're talking about just moving in a different way, engaging in a different activity um, to what you're used to or what your body is used to doing. And it has great, great effects on your mental health and on your happiness. Engaging in physical activity has numerous benefits, obviously, for both physical and mental health. And, and it can improve your mood and it can reduce your stress and all those things that we, we already know, right? But doing the same type of exercise or physical, physical activity over and over again can actually become kind of monotonous um, and it can lead to boredom and reduce motivation and non-compliance, right? If you go to the gym all the time and all you ever do is get on the treadmill and walk for 20 minutes, I mean, some people get off on that and that might be enough for some people, but that would bore the shit out of me and and uh, that would mean I wouldn't go, right? If, if I'd never investigate anything different from that, I'm going to get pretty sick of that pretty quickly. And that just means for me, um, when I get bored, I just chuck, chuck it in, right? I just stop doing it. So that's that's why it's important to keep pushing yourself, keep doing something different. Not, not necessarily, you know, more intense or harder or more challenging or more dangerous or anything like that. Just Just different, you know? trying a a new form of exercise or movement can help break up that monotony it stimulates different muscles and movement patterns um, and it can challenge the mind and the body in in new ways right so if you usually um, run or or ride a bike or something you could try doing a yoga class or a dance class if you typically just lift weights at the gym you could try a new activity potentially outdoor and in nature like we've already talked about before like you know rock climbing or kayaking or ocean swimming or something like that um there was a there was a paper that was from 2020 um now this is an australian study so um the name of the paper is depression anxiety and stress during covid uh associations with changes in physical activity sleep tobacco and alcohol use in australian adults so i do love an aussie study you know that so um we're going to talk about that today this this paper examines the associations between changes in physical activity um sleep both quality and duration tobacco and alcohol use with depression anxiety and stress right in 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 aussie adults so the study found that decreased physical activity poor sleep quality 
and increased tobacco and alcohol use were associated with higher levels of depression, anxiety, and stress. Right? On the other hand, increased physical activity and changing that physical activity was associated with lower levels of depression and anxiety. Um, one surprising factor, I don't know if it's that surprising from the study, is that changes in alcohol and tobacco use were not consistently associated with mental health outcomes. In some cases, increased alcohol use was associated with lower levels of depression and anxiety, while increased tobacco use was not significantly associated with any of the mental health outcomes. So it's, it's all, it's kind of points more to um, the exercise, the physical activity and the type of it and the variance of it than even the effect of tobacco or alcohol can have on a person. So... By engaging in new forms of movement, you can potentially discover a, a, you know, a new hobby or passion um, while also reaping the physical and mental benefits um, of exercise in general. Okay, number five in our nine simple things is to listen to a new type of music. So not just listening to music in general, but listening to a new type of music. Listening to music in general can have a really positive effect on our mood and our, and our emotions, both up and down, right? Um, so if you think about looking into a new genre of music or a new artist to expand your kind of musical horizons, this has a big benefit for your mental health and your happiness going forward. Um, this is something I talk to my clients a lot about and we, you know, I'm encouraging them to, to move more and all that and sometimes for them that means, you know, uh, walk around the block and so in that walk around the block which might take 10 minutes, that's kind of two music tracks, maybe two and a half, maybe three music tracks. I really encourage them to listen to not something they've listened to a thousand times, but something completely different. And Spotify does this really well. It's, it's not an ad for Spotify, but Spotify does this really well in, in creating playlists for you, you know, based on what you've listened to before and, and introducing you to new stuff. So um, it's a really, really good way to be able to boost your, your happiness and, and just your contentment in life. And, 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 I, and while also, you know, broadening your horizons a little bit too. Um, Music has been shown to have numerous, numerous positive effects on, on your mental health. Um, it can include uh, reducing your stress, reduced anxiety, improved mood, um, increased relaxation. Uh, when, when we listen to music, it can stimulate the release of dopamine in our brains. Um, and dopamine is a neurotransmitter associated with pleasure and reward. So this is why we kind of often feel uplifted and motivated after listening to our favorite songs, right? The stuff that we listen to all the time or the genre that we listen to all the time can really do that because it's a massive dopamine release for us. By exploring a new genre of music or a new artist, we expose ourselves again to different styles, rhythms, different lyrics that we might not have heard before. Now, that broadens our musical horizons, sure, but it also potentially introduces us to a new favorite artist, or a new favorite genre, um, which again can obviously lead to dopamine, which leads to happiness. Um, you know, additionally, listening to music in a different language um, can also be a great way to expand our cultural appreciation or cultural knowledge. So, um, you know, if you get a world music playlist on Spotify or something like that, um, you know, I, I, I traveled for a long time when I was younger through Latin America. I still listen to a lot of music in Spanish and, and it does hits different right it's just it, it sort of pushes me to um, improve my spanish again but it also just isn't something i listen to often or hear you know at the shops or in the car or whatever so it's it's nice it's a good way to kind of make my brain work a bit differently um and, and increasing my happiness as well um reduces stress and anxiety listening to calming music for instance has been shown to reduce the levels of the stress hormone cortisol uh, and lowers symptoms of anxiety. Um, music improves mood. Listening to upbeat music can improve your mood, uh, increases positive emotions, reduces negative emotions. Um, that's, that's the goal. Um, enhances your focus and productivity. Listening to music with a moderate tempo and low lyrics can enhance focus and productivity. Um, it can boost your self-esteem 
Music that promotes positive self-talk, for instance, can boost self-esteem and feelings of self-worth. And it can promote relaxation and sleep. Um, Listening to calming music before bed can promote relaxation and and improve the quality and the duration of your sleep. Um, Exploring new genres and artists can expand your musical horizons, introduce you to new types of music that may have specific benefits for your mental health, right? Um, For example, listening to classical music has been shown to reduce anxiety and improve your mood. While listening to nature sounds, uh, thunderstorm sounds, uh, forest, rainforest, trickling stream, whatever, can promote relaxation and reduce stress as well as having sleep benefits as well. There's a couple of papers uh, on this topic. They're both from 2021. Um, the first one is, was published in Frontiers in Psychology and, and it examines the relationship between music listening and life satisfaction. Um, so the study was conducted through an online survey. Again, um, participants were asked about their music listening habits and the satisfaction their life, uh, the satisfaction with their life at that time. Um, and the results suggested that music listening was positively associated with life satisfaction, even after controlling for demo- demographic factors, you know, mental health and other lifestyle factors. So a surprising finding from the study was that the positive relationship between music listening and life satisfaction was stronger for those who reported feeling more stressed during the pandemic. So if you've had a really stressful 2020 and 2021 when, when we're in the depths of COVID, um, listening to music has been shown to have huge benefits for your mental health and your happiness now in 2022-23. So um, yeah, I can't stress that high enough. If you've had a, a rough pandemic, um, listening to music is is a key out of it, right? The the second paper also for twenty also from twenty twenty one was in the clinical psychology and and psychotherapy review, um, and it talks about dance movement therapy for mental health. So it was a systematic review um, explored the neurocognitive mechanisms that underlie dance movement therapy for mental health, um, and investigated the effort uh, the effects of dance dancing basically on a range of mental health outcomes including depression anxiety and ptsd Um, and the authors sort of made the point that dance has the potential to promote changes in the brain function and structure and structure that are associated with improved mental health outcomes so it's a rewiring of the brain through dance this is creating a new neural pathway um, through dance and movement Um, One surprising finding from this paper is that the neurocognitive mechanisms that underlie dance for mental health are still not really well understood. Um, More research is needed to explore why it works, but it absolutely works in terms of... This was a big study, you know, big sample size. So there was... um, Dance is a a proven um, positive therapeutic intervention for mental health, Um, which is, you know, I mean... Probably everybody knows that to some level. If you, even if you hate dancing or you think you're no good at it or whatever, dancing is awesome, man. Like it makes you feel so much better. Um, it's instant release of, of endorphins and dopamine and all the good stuff, uh, serotonin, even the stuff that makes you, you know, really feel content and happy. Um, a lot of that is released during moments where you're daggy dancing. So, um, yeah, I strongly, highly recommend it. Um, the sixth simple thing that you can do today to be happier tomorrow is to take a break from social media. Now, this is going to sound odd coming from me, perhaps given my work background, but uh, my professional background in the past. But look, social media can be a source of stress and comparison for many people. And taking a break from it, even just for a day or two, can really help you reset and refocus. I recently had about a year away, mostly away from Instagram and different things because it was starting to really affect me and affect my mental health and my sense of happiness. And um, honestly, I, I, I can't recommend it enough. You know, there's, and especially for younger people, I think, you know, I just don't think much good comes from it, to be totally honest. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people who connect via social media who are otherwise socially disconnected so obviously that's an important thing but you know there is a lot of danger in that and and so i I did a bit a fair bit of study um 
on this on research on this researching this episode and one one paper that that i looked at was from 2020 from the psychology of popular media um, which is a journal and the paper was entitled facebook-based social support and health so it looked at the role of facebook-based social support in promoting well health and well-being what that means is um groups facebook groups people who are connected by friendship uh, and so on and people who drew their social support from using facebook um, there was an analysis of 17 different studies in this study. One of the main findings of the paper is that Facebook-based social support can have a positive effect on various aspects of health, including mental health, physical health, and health behaviors. And specifically, the studies reviewed found that Facebook-based social support was associated with reduced depression, anxiety, and stress. Um, it improved self-esteem and quality of life increased engagement in healthy behaviors like exercise and healthy eating so all those things are positive right the authors also note that facebook-based social support can provide u- unique benefits such as the ability to connect with people as i said before who share similar health conditions or experiences and their lifestyles the same um, and the convenience and accessibility of using social media to access social support is is good too however the authors also caution that the quality of Facebook-based social support can vary wide, widely, right? There's, there's lots of quantity, but the quality is varied and that there are potential risks associated with using social media for your health support, such as exposure to negative or inaccurate information, um, privacy concerns, um, conspiracy theories, all sorts of things like that, which aren't, aren't great for us, right? Overall, the paper suggests that Facebook social support can be available. Facebook-based social support can be a valuable tool for promoting health and well-being, but it's really important to use social media, use social media, sorry, in a thoughtful and intentional way to maximise its benefits and minimise its risks. The second paper, though, also from 2020, um, is entitled Social Media and Mental Health Benefits, Risks and Opportunities for Research and Practice. And it explores the complex relationship between social media use and mental health. Now, they reviewed a wide range of existing research again, highlighting both benefits and the risks. Um, uh, Something that uh, I found, even given that I used to work, you know, for Facebook and Twitter and used to work very much in this in this environment it's still crazy to me this is a global stat that 70 percent seven zero 70 percent of middle-aged people across the world use social media and up to 97 percent of people who are under 25 do that is globally that is not just you know uh developed countries that's 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 everywhere so the interesting thing about that, I guess, is that people with mental illnesses access social media at comparable rates, at the same rates as the general population does, but has but they have much less access to adequate mental health services. So they are getting some of their mental health service provision from these platforms, and that's just frightening, really. Um, one of the key findings from this paper is that social media can have, again, both positive and negative effects on your mental health. On the one hand, social media can facilitate social connections and support, um, promote mental health awareness and education, and it provides a sense of community and belonging. On the other hand, social media can also lead to social comparison, um, bullying, and exposure to harmful or triggering content, right? That's not really a surprise to anyone. The authors of that particular study also highlighted the need for more research to better understand the complex relationship between social media use and mental health. While some studies have suggested that social media use is is linked to increased anxiety, depression, other mental health issues like that, other studies have found little or no relationship. There's just not enough work done on this yet. Um, so overall, that paper in particular suggested that social media can be a valuable tool for promoting mental health and well-being, but it's important to use it again in a thoughtful and intentional way. Um, now, I don't always use social media in a thoughtful and intentional way, and I, I'm going to guess that you don't either. Um, that's the nature of the platforms is that they take away that mindfulness in some degree. They take away that purposeful Um, use of it that intentional use of it and more in just brain numbing way so um 
yeah, that's that's something to think about for sure. The third study, though, uh, from 2020, um, is an investigation of excessive social media use. Um, so this is an Italian study, um, in uh, Italian adults actually, uh, and it was explored the the excessive use. So that's a, I want to make that point um, in relation to loneliness and anxiety. Um, and the study found that social media was positively correlated with loneliness and anxiety, suggesting that it may not be an effective coping mechanism for those experiencing social isolation. Um, one surprising finding was that participants who reported higher levels of social media use also reported higher levels of engagement in online social activities such as video calling, um, FaceTiming, you know, uh, and that suggests that social media use may not be a substitute for face-to-face social interactions in reducing feelings of loneliness and activities and anxiety. So even though, you know, people will say, well, it's not just looking at a screen and typing, you know, I, I use FaceTime or I use Zoom or I use whatever, but this study found that those two things weren't linked. So even though people were using video calling and um, online meetings and FaceTime and whatever, it was still not having a positive effect on on their mental health. So that's uh, an interesting factor as well. All right, enough social media bashing. Number seven is to get creative. So engaging in creative pursuits like drawing, painting or writing um, can be a great way to boost your mood and reduce your stress. Engaging in creative pursuits has been shown to have numerous benefits for mental health and and well-being, um, whether it's drawing, painting, writing, um, or any other form of artistic expression, really. The act of creating something can provide a sense of accomplishment and improves your mood and reduces your stress. Um, Research has shown that engaging in creative activities can have a positive effect on your mental health. For example... A study published in the Journal of Positive Psychology found that engaging in creative activities such as writing or drawing um, can lead to increased feelings of well-being, uh, increased uh, or greater levels of positive emotions, um, greater sense of purpose, greater sense of meaning, um, greater levels of engagement with the world. Right. Similarly, a study published in the Journal of Psychosocial Nursing and Mental Health Services found that engaging in creative, ac- creative activities can help reduce your stress and anxiety and can be in a really effective way to manage your depressive symptoms as well, symptoms of depression as well. A lot of people will say to me, look, I'm not very arty though, I'm, I, I can't create beautiful things, you know, but I, I always think about, you know, the way that I make my bed every morning that's art, that's creativity, right? The way that I put peanut butter on a peanut butter sandwich, that is schmick, man. Like, and that's a great creative way. And it's just, you know, little things like that. You don't have to be able to paint beautiful things. You, we all create beautiful things and insightful things every day. If you look for it in the right places and, and the right ways, you'll find these things, you know? There's... Uh, there's a really great book I want to just mention before I forget, um, uh, which is called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, it's an amazing book. It's one of my favorite books. It's probably the book I buy for other people as gifts more than any other. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Big Magic is is amazing. It's about finding the magic in creativity and sharing creativity. I, I Honestly, I can't recommend it enough. It's so easy to read. And it's really beautiful and yeah, I I love it a lot. So if you want to check out a really good book that you haven't seen before that explores some things you might not have thought of before, then uh, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert is that book. Um, There's many uh, possible reasons why engaging in creative activities can have such a positive effect, right? Um, For one, creative activities provide an outlet for self-expression which can be especially important for individuals who may have difficulty expressing themselves through words alone so additionally creative activities require concentration and focus which can help to distract the mind from the negative thoughts and the worries that we experience Um, 
engaging in creativity and a creative pursuit can also provide a sense of accomplishment, as I said before, which can be especially important for individuals who might feel stuck or powerless in other areas of their life. So I, I can't do anything about my relationship. I can't do anything about my work or where I live. But I can make my bed really well or I can write in this journal every day or I can sketch a little thing or I can, you know, whatever. Um, It's a great way to be able to control what you can control in your life, right? Another possible explanation for the mental health benefits of creative pursuits is this concept of flow. Now, flow refers to a state of complete absorption and focus in an activity in, in which you are fully engaged and immersed in the experience. Um, engaged in create, engaging in creative activities can be a way to achieve this state of flow, which has been linked to increased happiness and well-being. If you ever feel like you are just doodling away or drawing or if you're writing or uh, whatever is your creative pursuit of choice and you lose track of time and stuff, that's, that's a good sign that you might be in that flow state, which is a really great way to increase your happiness. One surprising finding relating to the benefits of creativity is that it can actually help to improve your cognitive function as well as in older adults. Um, as I said uh, before, I, I work a little bit in, in uh, dementia and, and with people who are living with dementia and with people who live with people who live with dementia. And so this cognitive um, decline in older adults is really, uh, in, you know, it's a really interesting thing for me. It's something that I'm quite engaged in. There's a study published in the Journal of Aging and Health um, and it found that engaging in creative activities was associated with improved cognitive function in older adults. The the author suggested that engaging in creative activities might help to stimulate the brain and promote this neural plasticity, so rewiring of neural pathways, creating new neural pathways, which can be especially important for maintaining cognitive function as we get older and slowing down Um, the progression of dementia or even the onset of dementia so creativity is is huge man and it's a really great way to be able to control again um, what we can control and be in charge of our the decline or otherwise of our brain and and certainly of our happiness as well Um, it's worth noting that engaging in creative pursuits doesn't have to mean you know being a skilled artist or a writer as i said the you know the act of creating itself is more important often than the end result whether it's you know coloring in a coloring book writing in a journal doodling on a piece of paper um, making a bed making a great sandwich making a great coffee whatever that might be um, they all work it all works right Um, so in addition to the mental health benefits engaging in creativity um, can also have social benefits as well participating in creative groups or workshops um, can provide a sense of community and connection with others who share similar interests. And um, it can also provide an opportunity to learn from others, to share ideas and techniques, receive feedback, receive encouragement, have someone to say, ah, that's beautiful. What you created is beautiful. I love it, you know? Um, And obviously those things are are dopamine related. Those things are happiness related. Um, One study I want to just uh, dive into a little bit is from 2019 and it's about co-creativity right so the study implore uh, explores <laughs> the impact of a co-creative arts group um on the on the well-being of people again these are people living with dementia right so not necessarily a mental illness but it's a, a, a brain condition that we that we talk about a bit and that i work with a bit um the group was comprised of individuals with mild to moderate dementia and their caregivers Um, And they work together on creative projects like painting and sculpture and creative writing. Um, And it employed a case study approach. So they did um, in-depth interviews um, over a period of 10 weeks. Now, the findings of the study suggest that co-creativity, that is creating something with someone else, can have a positive impact on the well-being of people, um, more so than just doing it on your own or doing it on your own and then showing somebody for some feedback, right? This was creating something with somebody in partnership. Um, The participants reported feeling a sense of purpose and accomplishment, uh, improved mood, improved um, social interaction. They also reported feeling a greater sense of connection with their loved ones and a reduced burden of care. 
right? They felt like they weren't as much a burden on someone when they were putting stuff together, to, uh, you know, together. Um, the study suggests that co-creativity may provide an opportunity for people with dementia to express themselves creatively and engage in meaningful activity, promoting a sense of agency and autonomy. Um, one surprising finding from that study was the role of the caregiver in the co-creative process, right? So this is a person not affected by dementia in this case. The caregivers often played a key role in facilitating the creative work, providing support and encouragement to their loved ones with dementia. This dynamic challenged traditional notions of caregiving as the relationship between caregiver and care recipient shifted from one of def, uh, dependence to one of collaboration. And that shift in power dynamics may have contributed to the positive outcomes reported by the participants because it allowed for greater autonomy and self-expression for the people with dementia. They felt less burden. They felt they were less of a burden and that the, the caregiver was more a partner in their life or certainly in that little part of their life. It's pretty crazy, pretty amazing. The, the, overall, that study sort of highlights the potential benefits of co-creative activities. Um, so, and it suggests that co-creativity may be a valuable tool for promoting well-being and, and happiness and enhancing quality of life. It also sort of raises important questions about the role of caregivers and those who help uh, help us in our life if we, if we live with a mental illness like I do or if you just want to try and be happier. Um, the people who could potentially be part of that happiness are really important. The role of them in the co-creative process is important and the potential for co-creativity to challenge traditional notice, notions of caregiving, of friendship, of partnership, of community. You know, um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting study. Again, I'll put the, the link in the show notes, but it's, yeah, it's awesome. So overall, engaging in creative pursuits can be a powerful way to boost your mood, reduce stress, and promote overall well-being. And whether it's through writing or drawing or painting or any other form of artistic expression, finding ways to incorporate creativity into one's life can have a positive effect on mental health and quality of life. All right, so the final two things, simple things today that we can do to be happier tomorrow. Number eight is to learn something new. Um, learning a new skill or taking up a new hobby can be a great way to challenge your mind and boost your mood. Learning a new skill or taking up a new hobby can be an effective way to reduce your stress and boost your mental health. Engaging in new and unfamiliar activities stimulate the brain um, increasing feelings of accomplishment, self-esteem, uh, self-confidence, right? Learning new skills can also promote cognitive functioning and improve your memory and hold off um, cognitive decline, things like dementia. Studies have shown that engaging in intellectually stimulating activities like learning a new language, playing a musical instrument, um, all those things can lead to improved cognitive function in older adults and younger adults. So learning a new skill or hobby can be can also provide a sense of purpose and fulfillment, um, it, it, and it, it has a positive effect on loneliness. You know, it can especially be beneficial for people who are experiencing depression or feelings of emptiness. Learning new something new just it doesn't just kind of distract you from that. It actually boosts the parts of your brain that, that promote well being and promotes satisfaction with your life. Um, and and sometimes those things are, are lacking, right? Additionally, learning something new can provide a sense of control over, over your life. Um, it can be especially important for individuals experiencing anxiety or stress. Um, focusing on a new skill or learning a new hobby or language or something can shift your attention away from negative thoughts and worries. Uh, and instead, focus on the present moment. It can make you really mindful of the present moment and the engagement and the enjoyment of that activity. There are many different ways to learn something new from taking a class to self-teaching using an online resources or apps like Duolingo to learn a new language, for instance, on your app. Um, learning a new skill, it, it can also be a great way to connect with others though if you're not doing it just on your phone. Um, other people who share the same, same or similar interests which can lead to increased social support, feelings of belonging, dopamine release, happiness. 
right? So uh, these things you can see are, are kind of always interconnected. One, one surprising finding from research on the benefits of learning something new is that it can lead to improved physical health as well. So for instance, learning to cook healthier meals or taking up a new physical activity like dancing or yoga can lead to improved physical fitness and overall health. Uh, Additionally, engaging in mentally stimulating activities like learning a new language or playing a new musical instrument um, has been shown to have a protective effect on the brain and may reduce the risk of developing cognitive decline later in life. These are really important things that come from something very, very simple. You know, now, now, and I think it's important to point out here, it, you don't have to become proficient and fluent in Italian. Like learning something new can mean watching um, a documentary, watching Blue Planet, watching David Attenborough. I mean, every time I watch something of David Attenborough, I learn so many things that I didn't know before. So, you know, there's, there's great ways to do this that don't, necessarily improve becoming a master in something right overall learning something new can provide a wide range of benefits for mental and physical health it can increase your feelings of accomplishment provide a sense of purpose um, reduce stress and anxiety and and even lead as i said to improve physical health and whether it's taking a class trying a new hobby teaching yourself a new skill um, getting an app to teach yourself doing something in a group there are many ways to incorporate learning into your life and and to reap the benefits of that new skill or that new hobby or that new thing that you've learned for for your well-being and for your happiness in future That's number eight. Now, number nine is the final one. The final simple thing that you can do today that will uh, increase your happiness tomorrow is to do a random act of kindness. Now, I know some of you might be rolling your eyes right now and I know it sounds really woo-woo, but just hear me out, right? Doing something kind for someone else, whether that's a stranger, complete stranger or someone you love, um, can not only make them feel good, it also gives you a sense of purpose and connection. So, Firstly, what exactly is a random act of kindness, right? It's essentially any action that is done um, to help or benefit another person without any expectation of reward or recognition for yourself. Uh, It can be things like paying for someone's coffee behind you, um, leaving a positive note for a co-worker, helping someone carry their groceries. I mean, God, there's a million things, right? But research has shown that performing these random acts of kindness can have a positive effect on our mental health. One study published in the Journal of Social Psychology found that participants who performed acts of kindness for 10 days in a row repeated, sorry, reported increased levels of happiness compared to those who did not engage in kind acts. Additionally, the research has found that the positive effects on the kind acts were not just limited to the person performing them, but also extended to the recipients of the acts. That makes sense, right? But there are a few reasons why performing acts of kindness can benefit your mental health. One is that it can increase feelings of social connection and belonging. We've already covered that. Um, When we do something kind for someone else, it it can create a sense of closeness and positivity in our relationships with that person and with others in general. Um, This can lead to increased feelings of social support and a sense of belonging to a community, both of which are really important for maintaining good mental health. Um, Another reason is that performing acts of kindness can boost self-esteem. When we do something good for others, it can give us a sense of accomplishment and purpose. It can also make us feel good about ourselves and our ability to make a positive impact in the world. Again, this doesn't have to be some huge gesture right? But even the smallest gesture leads to increased feelings of self-worth and confidence, which can help protect against negative mental health outcomes like depression and anxiety. Now, finally, performing acts of kindness can also help reduce our stress. When we, when we engage in kind acts, it can shift our focus away from our own problems and concerns and onto others. So this can help break our negative thought patterns and reduce our stress. Um, also, when we perform an uh, act of kindness, it releases the feel-good hormones like oxytocin and endorphins, which can counteract those negative effects of stress on the body and the mind that they might be experiencing at the time. Um, one surprising finding about performing acts of kindness is that it doesn't necessarily have to be big or elaborate. 
uh, a gesture to have a positive impact. Even the smallest acts of kindness can make a really, really big difference. In fact, research has shown that performing multiple acts of kindness throughout the day can be more beneficial for mental health than doing one large act of kindness. Um, so that's interesting, right? There was a book um, uh, in 2020 uh, released and the name of the book is Gorilla Altruism, Maximizing the Acts of Kindness for Wellbeing. I just think it's a great name, Gorilla Altruism. Not gorilla like, like gorilla like, you know, gorilla warfare. Um, Emily Sheila is the writer. She's a social psychologist um, and she works at the University of Virginia in their Positive Psychology Center in, in America. Uh, in the book, she discusses the concept of guerrilla altruism, which refers to intentionally seeking out and performing acts of kindness in unexpected ways and places in order to maximize the positive impact on both the giver and the receiver. Um, she talks about how performing acts of kindness not only benefit the recipient, but also have a positive impact on the person performing the act. She explains that kindness releases these neurotransmitters in the brain like dopamine, serotonin, the ones we've talked about before, which promote feelings of happiness and well-being. And, and furthermore, performing acts of kindness can also increase the social connection as it fosters a sense of community and belonging, which is a, the, in the cycle then, the circle that brings back around to, you know, dopamine release and happiness. Um, the book is awesome. It provides a comprehensive guide to incorporating acts of kindness into your daily life with the goal of maximizing their impact on well-being. She also includes heaps of practical tips and strategies on how to identify opportunities for kindness how to tailor acts of kindness to individual preferences and strengths. It's kind of like a textbook for kindness. Um, one of the surprising findings in the book is that the most effective acts of kindness are those that are ex unexpected or out of the box, right? So um, she encourages readers to think creatively about how they can perform these acts of kindness, like leaving a kind note for a stranger, anonymously paying for someone's meal as you leave and they're still eating, um, she also emphasizes the importance of self-care though, which is a really important part of this when it comes to performing acts of self-kindness, um, explaining that uh, practicing self-compassion and setting realistic expectations for yourself is really crucial uh, in order to, bur to avoid burnout or exhaustion. Right? Um, you've got to you've got to go into this with really realistic expectations of what you what you're going to get out of it, basically. Um, so that's that's a good book, something that's something that I think uh, is worth having a look at. So, in conclusion, the performing acts of kindness can be a simple but effective way to boost our mental health by increasing feelings of social connection, boosting self-esteem, reducing stress. Acts of kindness can help protect against negative mental health outcomes and promote overall well-being and happiness. So the next time you're feeling down, you know, consider doing something kind for somebody else. It doesn't have to be a big gesture. It doesn't have to be expensive. It might just be the boost you need. So that's it. They're the nine simple things um, that you can do today that will make you happier tomorrow number one spend time in nature number two practice gratitude even single session gratitude number three connect with someone number four move your body in a new way listen to new type of music is number five number six take a break from social media so important number seven get creative number eight learn something new and number nine do a random act of kindness they're the nine things that I think if they're very simple things that I think if we can incorporate those into our day today, then it makes it gives us a chance to be happier tomorrow. Um, I'm really stoked that we that, that I've had your attention this long um, and I appreciate that. I really hope you have a happy day today and a happier day tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to leave a, a comment or anything on either the website or the podcast or wherever you listening to this, um, that would be great. I'll try to get back to all of them um, or a review, a, a five-star review if you think it's worth that. Um, that really helps us too. So thanks so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions or you have any suggested topics you want me to research the shit out of like I've done this week, um, please just send it through and I'll uh, either as a voice message or just a, a text message or a, a message on the website i'd love to hear from you and 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 make this a podcast that you know you're interested in by 
by giving me the content that you're really interested in to research for you. Um, I hope you're having a great day wherever you are and I hope you have a better day tomorrow. Thanks so much for listening. All right, hooroo.